What if the darkest hour? If you're not talking oh. smack, just before everything goes completely black. The virologists are watching the impending train wreck while the cops are busy with their knees on the necks of the essential workers picking the fruit trees, working in the warehouses and dying of disease if ICE does not arrest them and deport them from their beds to make sure Guatemala gets its fair share of the dead. It's November 2020. It's been quite a year. I can't imagine where we'll be once December is here. Once December is here. Once December is here. Oh. All right. Uh, that was uh, David uh, Rovit, uh, and uh, a bit depressing, uh, but uh, shows us what is uh, what we have to deal with. Uh, hopefully, and we'll talk about that as well. Now that the election should be over, <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, there were issues past that uh, many of us put in place. Uh, or help put in place years ago, uh, the electric service aggregation program measures, right? The uh, city uh, essentially buying uh, clean uh, energy, that is issue one. Uh, it passed, of course. Uh, there was a blue tsunami in Franklin County. <laughs> Overwhelmingly, every Republican official uh, went down to defeat. Uh, the Civilian Review Board, although not uh, with any uh, detail, any great detail, uh, passed as well. Uh, also, uh, Gary Tyak was elected prosecutor, and already there's talk. Uh, he's reaching out to progressive lawyers on what he's calling a conviction integrity program to see which cops can actually uh, be trusted. Many of you would say none, but uh, uh, there's usually a disproportionate amount of uh, uh, police, a small amount that disproportionately lie and commit perjury. So it'd be nice to be able to keep tabs uh, on uh, those uh, police officers. Uh, also, uh, uh, Terry Jameson originally endorsed by the Green Party and later the Democrats, uh, was elected to the appeals court in Franklin County as Jennifer Bruner was elected uh, to, of course, the Ohio Supreme Court. So there's a variety of people considered very progressive uh, that are getting uh, elected. Uh, the question is, uh, what is our agenda, right? If we're gonna hold their feet to the fire, well, we need uh, to decide uh, what our programs are. Um, let's see. Uh, good things nationally. Uh, uh, again, you see. So we'll see what's going on. The return of the uh, blue wall in Michigan. Uh, and again, Arizona, uh, in part because of the attack on John uh, okay. uh, McCain by Trump, uh, went from being a red state to a purple uh, and voting blue in this election. So uh, some things to consider. Uh, the good news for most of us, Biden won. The bad news, Biden won, uh, which leaves a huge agenda as to what uh, we want him uh, to do. Uh, again, Cornell West's point that a vote for Biden wasn't necessarily a vote for Biden. Uh, it was in many ways a vote against fascism. Uh, so uh, numerous election integrity issues, uh, which we should deal with, uh, which we'll talk about later. 
uh, in uh, the salon. Uh, and again, uh, the issue of the Electoral College uh, and its longtime uh, racist nature we'll deal with as well. Uh, and again, uh, a key question that we have, we're getting some echo here, a key question that we're going to ask Marilyn Howard uh, here in a few minutes is, you know, uh, how do, why did 70 million people vote for Donald Trump? Right? Donald Trump, to a large extent, my perspective, the embodiment uh, of the ugly American, uh, everything people in the third world have complained about, we created in one uh, candidate. And the fact that he took Ohio and we all live here, uh, uh, we have to consider what exactly is wrong uh, with this state. So we'll talk about that uh, in a few minutes. Uh, so uh, first time since 1960, uh, as Ohio goes, so goes the nation. Uh, not true. The last time this uh, happened is when uh, Kennedy had enough sense to run Lyndon Johnson, uh, who may have later been involved uh, uh, with his demise. Uh, oh, look, there's Bob and but, Suzanne. Uh, what was that? <laughs> Somebody's got their mic not muted. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, again, the question that with Lyndon Johnson, he didn't need Ohio. So Ohio is a great predictor in Ohio going red, things we should concern ourselves with. So uh, with that in mind, and let me offer some of the following. Uh, America has a long tradition of irrationality and anti-intellectualism. Uh, de Tocqueville Bill, uh, wrote about this in Democracy in America, right? The French nobleman. And it's this concept of absolute uh, de uh, dedication to equality, where essentially my ignorance trumps your book learning, and that people that actually know things and study facts are not to be trusted. With that, I give you Marilyn Howard, uh, again, my fellow Columbus State uh, professor, uh, again, professor of, of uh, Black history. Uh, in the humanities department, but she used to be in the social sciences department. Uh, also, she has a master's in political science. Uh, and we can pose to her uh, many questions. She's a free press board member. She's a free press book reviewer and wrote a uh, very important dissertation on lynchings in Ohio. Uh, a dozen or so lynchings that were documented in this state. So the question of how much does white supremacy, and by the way, she's writing a forward to a book I co-wrote, which should be coming out uh, in July on white supremacy. So with that, uh, let me ask you, Marilyn, does this got anything to do with white supremacy, white skin privilege? I don't know if she's uh -huh. still here. Oh, there she is. Oh no! <laughs> really? How dare you? Can we? Can well, we see good to see you. Marilyn, uh, for we asking see me to, to join you. Uh, well, you know, I live in Upper Arlington, so <laughs> which is 0.08 percent black. Um, Marilyn, and I already had uh, two. Uh, Marilyn, can you turn on your uh, video? Yeah. Sorry. There you are. I've already had a couple of. Uh, disappointing uh incidents with with regard to race but that that's another program um my question is first um i guess what i was so shocked at is that so many uh african americans mostly african american men uh came out and supported trump uh you know we've talked to uh joan jones about this we talked about this last sunday and you know, where the heck did that come from? And generally, you know, I don't bother people. I don't, you know, judge people's political choices. This is one of the beauties of uh, living in America. But I, I cannot fathom why that is. The only thing I can think is, is the people who were, the black people who were spotlighted for being supporters of hers, these extremely rich uh, people in entertainment, especially rappers. Uh, they share some of his uh, characteristics, misogynist, uh, uh, sexist, uh, those kinds of things, but um, 
you know, other than sticking a thumb in somebody's eye, I don't know what that was for. So um, now, as I said, I, I, I live in Arlington. And really, all I've got to do is like go out my front door and cross the street. And it was pretty, pretty bare. So I'm assuming that most Arlingtonians had already uh, voted uh, by mail. I did not see uh, any of the other Black people who live in Arlington, <laughs> just me. So sometimes I think I'm the only one here. But um, I think you could, at least I felt for the last year or so that Trump was unraveling and that he could be uh, taken down. He'd gotten even crazier than before. He got, and and this, whole ha this whole thing about the, the coronavirus, it's like, he's like Robert McNamara. He has blood on his hands. He has blood on his hands because there was a point at which he could have stepped in here from the beginning and we would not be doing what we are doing. But um, he uh, refused to do that. And, and I found out that I have a COVID-19 semi-denier in my own family. It was heartbreaking <laughs> to get that news. He uh, doesn't think it's such a thing. And, and yeah, it might be, it's probably like a flu and there aren't many, as many people who are sick as they say they are and stuff. So I, I'm, I don't know, I've just kind of blocked that out of my mind. But he has, I do think, and I say this seriously, he has blood on his hands. He did nothing about this. He stood by, he made fun of it. He made fun of people who were taking it seriously. Uh, he's darn near wiped out the whole secret service team that protects him. Uh, his wife was sick, his son was sick, he was sick. Um, I, I don't know, um, it, I, but I just felt like this was sort of the last hurrah for him this last year. You could just see him unraveling. So certainly happy with the result, but as you said, um, uh, was a vote he took, he took Biden, this necessarily a vote for handily. Biden. Yeah, how, how, how do you uh, account for Trump? Uh, Biden was supposed to win by, you know, one or two points in Ohio. How, how do you uh, account for uh, the victory uh, by Trump in Ohio? Well, Does that have anything to do with, you know, uh, white hegemony, demographics, some sort of cultural war? Yeah, it, it is um, outside of the, the, you know, the seven or eight large urban areas, Ohio is really more like a rural state. And, you know, came into the union in 1803, and it's always had this anti-black uh, view. Uh, black people were not, black men couldn't join the militia, black children couldn't uh, use the few public schools there were. You know, it was not supposed to have slavery, but it did. It had the Underground Railroad, but it's not nearly as big as people think. So, you know, Ohio has a, a racist history that goes back uh, quite far. And except for those, you know, seven urban areas, it really is more like a, a, a rural kind of state, or at least a mindset uh, of, a, of a real rural kind of people. So um, I had hoped that Biden would be able to uh, take uh, Ohio. And I was very surprised when, when I found out. I didn't dare watch. I waited till the next morning and called a friend and wanted to ask who won. Because after 2016, I just, I couldn't, I couldn't watch another election. But I had hoped that Biden would take Ohio. And, but you know, it is what it is. Was there an Obama backlash? Oh, um, I, I yeah, I think to a certain extent. You got to remember the the if you look at uh, the demographic in the neighborhood that you know I live in, uh, it was white college educated women who had twice voted for Obama, who voted for Trump. Uh, so. And I think too, that was why Obama didn't step in until almost what, the end of the campaign, because uh, as much as people love Mrs. Obama, they don't have the same feeling for Obama himself. And of course the African-American community is very proud of the Obamas, of course we are. But most African-Americans would say that things weren't that much better in the eight years when he was in the Oval Office. Cool. All right. And what about this sort of irrationality? You talk about Trump having blood on his hands, but part of that, right, is being anti-science, being uh, attacking his own uh, healthcare professionals. Uh, well, as you know, we have uh, a history of that anti-intellectualism <laughs> here in America. Think back to the 50s. 
you know, God forbid anybody go to college or learn how to read and write or conjugate verbs the right way or whatever. So that's that's deep in in the political uh, uh, DNA of uh, America. But they have uh, uh, you know taken it to uh, a new place. Did you, as an African American, when education is is very very important in the black community. It, it always has been. And I don't think I ever thought I'd live to see the day when people would sneer at somebody who had a college education. And you know, when you were talking right before you opened up the, the floor here for those of us who are here, um, I remember that when um, the Kennedys were going in in the White House, the Eisenhowers were uh, coming out and Mrs. Eisenhower as the first lady was giving the incoming first lady a tour of the White House. She referred to Jackie Kennedy as that college girl. All right. So this anti-intellectual uh, sneering at people who, who get an education and, and so many people like, you know, my own brother is the COVID-19 denier. I don't think I could take it. <laughs> I'll have to hide. Yeah. Something. One, one, of, um, uh, one of the things we're getting some questions in, uh, the argument is that many black males, uh, it was a fuck you vote to Biden because of his support uh, for the uh, you know the crime bills, the mm -hmm. the tremendous rise of the uh, prison industrial complex is that and uh, you know back when he was in his early years in the Senate, he he voted against uh, court order busing, uh, and in spite of his summer working in a, at a black pool as a life lifeguard or whatever it was he did, um, I I think that you know many when when the field was still really crowded. Uh, black people weren't really very impressed with Biden, but as you know, other people get peeled off. Um, again, it is what it is. But, uh, but to, to some extent, was there not a backlash because Trump actually agreed with uh, essentially a, a black point of view and accused Biden of being uh, racist in terms of his policies? Uh, you know, I'm 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 not real sure. I know what it means for those of us who love the process and who have studied it and have little pieces of paper in it, but I'm not real sure how far that kind of thing goes uh, for the average person. I think that if you think of the kind of people who came out for him, these very rich rappers and social, whatever they call themselves, social, what, what is it they, they got a little name for when they're socially, people listen to them. I, I don't know what the term is, but you know, I think a lot of them uh, were uh, black males. It's it's still people, uh, I'm sure a lot of white people would be surprised about this, but the black community is still relatively conservative uh, when it comes to things such as uh, values and, and gender and those kinds of things. And so, uh, yeah, I think this was a big, this was an opportunity for those guys to be seen in the president's office and for the president to say, see, I like black people, you know, ice whatever it is is my friend <laughs> and he's going to rally all the black voters for me the ice cube i get them mixed up i think it's ice cube uh so i i i think that's a combination of things but i don't um this thing of um thumbing at at biden i'm not i'm not real sure if that was was the case um, i don't know i haven't poured over the the breakdown and stuff as you have uh but i think you know you remember too that you know obama one of the things that happened in the black community in 2016 was that turnoff fell off tremendously. There was no way to vote for a third term for the first black president. And so black voters just stayed home. Uh, there's so been some get other, the vote thing was, was very, very important. There's been some other comments here. I was gonna just summarize. Yes. Uh, Laurel said a friend who canvassed said black males were voting for Trump because he was telling the truth and he let others experience our dis disparate state and they were trying to bring down the system. Some of uh, Adrian's cousins or young males said they, they thought he was a G. As in a gangster? Oh. <laughs> it's like with, with an A. Okay. Let me let me Go ahead, Adrian. Yeah, let me bring clarity to that. So, um, <laughs> So yes, yes, Bob, to your point, a gangster, a real G. They they just thought that, you know, his his truth, quote unquote, his truth speaking, um, and the way that he came um at people like the reporters and 
you know, all of those things that he did, he was just like, he stood his ground. He didn't punk down. Um, all of those kind of lingos that go in, in the community. I heard my little cousin saying, and it uh, and they're, my and they're right. He, he's been hooked up with the Russian mafia since <laughs> the beginning. So he definitely has gangster he credentials. He is a legendary. Yeah, yeah he's a gangster. Right. Not gangster. Yeah, so that that was um, that was their unfortunate um, thought process um, when it came to Donald Trump. It was just like, oh, because he's a real G. And I'm like, oh, my God, I got work to do. Yeah, <laughs> they didn't say he was a real G. <laughs> <laughs> <What is that? laughs> well, and, and you know that hyper masculinity that he has, and you know, I I hate to say it, but you know the the black community, the relationship between black women and black men, it's it's problematic, uh, depending on what age cohort you in are in, and that sort of that hyper masculinity that is so popular, uh, particularly for young black men. So, I mean, what do you say? <laughs> so a couple people think that more white women voted for him again in 2020. I guess that's been uh, in the news or something and that's how disappointing that is. And um, some people felt like uh, Trump's fear mongering helped him. Uh, let's see, uh, Obama let over 5 million people lose their homes. Um, let's see. And people were talking about Kamala Harris and her prosecution record and things like that. Yeah, the death penalty cases and and stuff. That was a that was an interesting pick for um, Biden. Uh, I mean, you know, you know, again, there's the tremendous pride in the African American community because uh, Kamala Harris has, has been chosen for that. In fact, I'm wearing my shirt. We make a difference, Black women for Biden Harris 2020. Um, and a, a lot of love for her and pride and, and all those kinds of things. But you're right. She has um, um, her years as a, a prosecutor and attorney general uh, in the black community. Those, those experiences to them are, are mixed. You know, they're not, um, they, they, were, they were issues for her. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, who isn't, um, who isn't proud of, of her and where she got to be and so forth. Yeah. So I turned to election integrity a little bit. Yeah, we're gonna move. Are there first of all, are there any questions for Marilyn while while she's here? Uh, anyone wanna unmute and uh, or come unmute and ask her a question? Wanna? You know, one thing I want to bring up, Bob, is I unlike in when the two times uh, Obama ran, I I saw I didn't see a half dozen political signs in my community either way. No one had out political signs. And I thought that was that was very odd. So that, you know, that suggests to me there's a lot of that hidden, hidden support for Trump in this community. Scary. And uh, that's one of the questions of election uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, election uh, uh, integrity is, you know, are some of the Trump supporters lying because the exit polls uh, tend to be off with Donald Trump more than any other uh, candidate. And this would- The Bradley effect, yeah. Where, where this would come into play is not in the rural areas that love Trump and where everyone's got signs, but in precisely the well-educated middle-class, upper middle-class suburban areas uh, where people may want to hide, hide their, yeah. or, you know, for the old, uh, old G. Yeah. So I think Bob is going to now give us a little rundown nationally of what he's been discovering about the, in the election integrity world, because he's been in, involved in a lot of the um, other states' business and, and what's happening in regards to Biden actually possibly winning if these states count themselves. So do you want to give us that roundup real quick? Well, uh, Many of you have seen that there'll be a recount in Wisconsin uh, as well as Georgia, uh, but uh, there's other areas as well. Pennsylvania, some of you may have seen that uh, uh, Porter Wright, Morris, and Arthur <laughs> uh, withdrew from representing uh, Trump. Yeah, they didn't. Trump <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
talked to my lawyer friend about that a lot last night. Uh, did you? Yeah. Any insight for us without breaking any ethnic rules? Um, you know, he's, I, I, I think it was more like, well, he wasn't surprised that they would defend Trump, you know? He's but uh, Jones, Jones Day as well has stayed yes. in the fight from uh, Cleveland, one of the world's largest uh, corporate law firms. Mm -hmm. I saw Cliff Arnebeck out there who uh, uh, knows these law firms uh, uh, well. But again, uh, just, uh, I mean, my take, and many of you have already heard this, uh, but uh, I think he's trying to, under the Electoral uh, uh, Count Act of 1887, uh, essentially delay things particularly by filing lawsuits uh, that will then get us past Safe Harbor Day and there'll be no uh, electoral slate seated and hence it will default to the state legislatures in those states uh, if the delegates are not seated. And the key thing we need to keep in mind, of course, is that there's nothing in the constitution that links the electoral college to the popular vote of the people, right? There's some state laws, but there's nothing that constitutionally mandates it. And then uh, if that, uh, no one gets 270, no one gets the majority, it would go to the house. To the house. Well, they'll yeah. vote by state. And my count is 26 states uh, for Trump. So uh, with that in mind- Is that good or bad? Well, that means he's the next president. <laughs> no, we don't want to stop with that. Tell us how that's not going to happen. Well, I don't, I don't know if it's, it's, it's only not going to happen because uh, there seems to be a tremendous pushback by mainstream institutions. Yes. Uh, and again, uh, my initial report, I don't know how it turned out, but uh, observers are saying there's a very low turnout today uh, for his, uh, you know, million you know, arm guides, uh, a march. Million, mag, mi million MAGA march or something. Yeah. I heard a thousand times. <laughs> I heard a thousand. Yeah, now the most I heard was 2,500. So, which is similar to a thousand, right? Yeah. Same range. So, uh, so with the, the Supreme Court ruling in July said that, and, and the, like the first sentence they said is that they, uh, electors have to, choose the popular state vote. Didn't it say that in that ruling? That was like the first sentence in the ruling. It says that they have to pick the popular state vote. And I, everybody keeps talking about picking the electors and having them. Well, if the state says, you know, whatever, which we know is yeah. the case, whatever they are. The, the question is uh, whether or not, if you, if you don't meet certification, Federal law is pretty clear. What does that mean? I mean, mean yeah, I mean, there's a time period. I mean, you've got to get your certification in six days prior uh, to December 14th, your certification of the electors. So if you don't certify, how can the courts then require uh, it to happen? So is it a well, as long as a popular vote is no, no, it's a tactic. Obvious, but then uh, you're saying that, that's why they be. needed uh, their strategies falling apart uh, to the extent uh, part of it they needed to get a lot of people in the streets and be able to disrupt, you know, certain counties and Secretary of State's office in key states. I mean, you saw the New York Times uh, polled every single Secretary of State, and not one of them said. Uh, that they thought uh, there was uh, illegal activity going on. I mean, election fraud. Uh, well, illegal activity, election tampering. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, uh, even Republicans are saying that that you know the right. The, there's just nothing there. There's nothing there. But, but they're not pushing back hard uh, at the McConnell and at the level because of the situation in Georgia, where they need Trump. Oh to keep control of the Senate. So certain people in the Republican party, including George W. Bush and many people in his administration uh, in Kasich uh, are pushing back. And that whole, you know, Lincoln Republican group uh, 
at, project. Yeah, right. the project people. But in places like Georgia and Mitch McConnell, they're doing the exact opposite. Uh, I mean, Lindsey Graham and Mitch McConnell, they understand uh, power. They need Trump to con uh, control the Senate. So your worries are that somehow their strategy is going to make it so he delays it long enough? Well, that is a strategy. That's what uh, Porter Wright was doing. Now that they've resigned, that's what Jones Day was doing, right? You want to uh, get it in to the legal area where hopefully you can tie it up in court. So uh, December 8th, uh, six days before the meeting of the electoral uh, delegates at the state level uh, is they're not certified. So there's no certification, mm -hmm. thus defaulting that to the state legislatures. Is there anything we well, the only, What are the states that are on hold? It's Georgia, obviously, but the Secretary of State seemed like he was ready to go and it was going to be done by the time it'd be certified at the proper time with the recount. Um, but then you do have the, the election for but, the but, Senate. Uh, I the think state. they were okay. counting on strategically filing suits at different times to delay as long mm -hmm. as possible. But you're right, by state law, and this is where the Republicans that were pushing back uh, against Trump uh, come in handy, because it looks like most of them. But look, if you're doing a hand count, a uh, hand recount in Wisconsin and Georgia, uh, how long is that going to take? And what if you began to file state and federal lawsuits in the middle of it to delay? Bob? They have to have their count down by Wednesday at midnight, right. Georgia does. But what yep. if there's lawsuits that are considered legitimate or if something comes up in the recount? Bob? Yes, go ahead. Uh, I investigated the uh, matter of Jones Day's involvement in the 2020 general election. Um, and the, the attack, there's a coordinated attack on Jones Day. And it's being orchestrated by Scott Horton, who is a counsel with the uh, DLA Piper law firm. DLA Piper is the law firm in which Kamala Harris's uh, husband is, a, is, is a, a member. And it's also, uh, Scott represents uh, George Soros and his interests. And he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, a, he's a serious uh, player in the uh, government overthrow uh, program o overseas and perhaps here. Um, because, of, uh, because of this attack, which, which uh, uh, Horton appointed directly at Jones Day as if they were the leader of the um, Trump campaign strategy. And in fact, uh, the, the, and there, he was trying to stir up clients to complain uh, against Jones Day. The truth is, or in response to this, Jones Day posted on its website that their, their only involvement in the 2020 general election is representing the Pennsylvania Republican Party that asked them to challenge the state courts in Pennsylvania extending of the, uh, the date by which votes were gonna be counted. That's, and they say that's their only involvement. They're not bringing, they're not participating in any claim in regard to fraud in the election or anything else. Now that may be a critical uh, factor here uh, the, in, in the, uh, as, you, as you described, this may go to, uh, this may get down to pretty, pretty uh, narrow numbers. It may get, get, get down to Pennsylvania. And, in, and, and when the Supreme Court of the United States was asked to rule on this question of the uh, of the uh, uh, the legality of the uh, uh, state supreme court in in Pennsylvania extending the deadline, uh, and and Jones Day's argument is that the the Constitution says that it's the state legislature, not the courts, that that establish the rules of the game in an election. 
And what the Supreme Court said is we're not going to rule on this now, but segregate all the ballots that are counted after the, um, the, the election day. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it becomes important or relevant, we'll take it up then. Right. Now that what's really important now is that with with the addition of the uh, uh, the the, uh, the ninth uh, just, justice, uh, there will be uh, a five is it five no is it it's Alito uh, Supreme Court split the Chief Justice and the three appointed so it's it's five five to uh, Five, four, six. Five, four. Yeah, yeah it, it's, uh, it's, the, uh, and Jones Day, <laughs> keep this in mind. Um, uh, Jones Day is uh, as close as anybody in the United States to the Supreme Court. I mean, they make a practice of hiring as many clerks in the Supreme Court as possible. Um, uh, Scalia was, a, was, a, was an alumnus of Jones Day. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, 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 all the people that were Trump appointed were uh, screened and a partner of Jones Day who served as White House counsel. Not only did he screen them for selection, he prepped them for their appearances before the Senate uh, Judiciary Committee. Uh, right. And so, so the bond is very close. And I, what I would say that if it comes down to uh, Pennsylvania and it comes down to a, the, the Supreme Court uh, readdressing that issue, uh, Jones Day and the and the Pennsylvania uh, Republican Party are nearly sure to win. And I feel very I'm confident on that point, which I think is essential. We'll talk about this later because we have Jasmine Ayers here, but I think that's a very key point. So we'll uh, bring that back up, but I think your analysis is, in fact, correct. And they just won on the 10,000 uh, ballots just uh, recently. Uh, so Jasmine Ayer's time is limited. So I saw uh, that she's ready and uh, we can stick around and talk about this. I think Cliff has raised a very important point. So uh, Jasmine Ayers, who's run for city council, uh, who has been at the grassroots level uh, in terms of trying to get accountability for police uh, and again has limited time but is with the working group uh, that is dealing with uh, police reform. So uh, Jasmine, go Thank ahead. You. Thank you so much for having me and I apologize for being brief. I've been picking up trash and linden with teenagers from 9 a.m. until like I just got home. Um, so like all I want to do is get into a bathtub. <laughs> but I really appreciate you all uh, for having me. And um, if you'd like, I can just give a quick summary of sort of where we are and yeah. what it's looking like moving forward. Yeah. Cool. So we passed issue two, and really the uh, sort of what we were going for was not we thought that it would pass, right? But it was by what margins. And so um, what I have been told is that this is going to be a negotiating tool for the city when they go to the table and say, not only did the people of Columbus request a civilian review board, but on top of that, over 70% of them said that this is something that they want. And so this is not some irrational fantasy that the mayor has that he just wants to implement on his own. The people of Columbus are actually really calling for this. So the resounding win was exciting. Um, we were supposed to have our last civilian review board meeting um, this past week, but we there wasn't enough time to get everything done. So we're going to have one more. Um, these meetings are public. And what I would say the biggest sticking point right now is I have been advocating for a partially appointed, partially elected board. Um, the pushback is that if you have elections, it then becomes political and then money gets involved. And then I get that it's hard, but my thing is usually the things that are hard are what's best for the people of Columbus. Mm -hmm. uh, and the easy route is not what we should be exploring. If it is going to be an appointment process, there are people um, who are arguing that 
the mayor and city council should not have the ability to appoint people and that so that we should come up with basically a community council of organizations um, and people like St. Stephen's Community House in Linden to sit and go through all of these applications and pick these folks. So I think sort of that's where we are right now. Uh, in terms of years of service, um, I believe we settled on four year terms and you can serve two terms. So there will be term limits. Um, at least that's what we're negotiating for. So all of this has to get negotiated with the FOP contract. And what I've learned through this process is that a lot of this is state law. It's through the collective bargaining process, um, which I'm very excited that Dontavius Gerald will be at the state house because we've had extensive conversations about what it looks like to think about police reform beyond just like a traditional measure. Um, and so this is one of the things that we've been talking about is why is this process continuing to protect a corrupt police department? And what are the things that we can do sort of at the state level to fix that? Um, but we're also considering sort of innovative things like making sure that we have a social worker either part-time or full-time because we know that if you had a bad encounter with a cop that came to resulted in a level in where you felt the need to file some sort of form and come forward and give testimony that you are probably traumatized and you probably need access to resources and mental health counseling. So we want to try to make this as holistic as possible. Um, but what I would encourage people to do is to go watch the previous videos, sort of see where we stand. And if you have ideas, if there are things that you want to see on there that we haven't been discussing, or if there are things that you are like, this is dangerous and we do not need to have that, like, please write your council members, please write the mayor. Um, I, there, there's like a, there's like a crew of three of us that are sort of a little bit more progressive and have been arguing for some things, but there's only three of us. And so uh, we could absolutely use you all's help um, in this fight to say, these are the things that absolutely need to stand. Um, and this is what we want to see. Three out of how many? So tech, the panel is rather large, but I would say consistently, there's about 10 of us that show up consistently. To the uh, what about subpoena power? I saw the uh, mayor was mentioning uh, that, something near and dear to my heart. That has been um, agreed upon across the board, right? Everybody is like, we absolutely need subpoena power um, in the office of the inspector general. And what we have discussed, I, I can't promise you what we give to the mayor is actually going to be what they negotiate. But what we have talked about is that um, in addition to the inspector general's office having investiga investigatory power, the civilian review board will also have investigatory power, which isn't in any model across the country, right? So, um, right, we're thinking some of the like more like intense violent things will immediately go to the inspector general's route. But like, if you are shouting profanity at a elementary age child, we, we can investigate that as people and we can make you have some sort of mediation. Um, and so while we won't necessarily be able to enforce what I would say is like discipline, I think one of the things that we call to be able to enforce was mediation um, and making officers sit down at the table and have conversations with people and apologize for the things that they've done. Um, so we also want to be able to the inspector general's office is not going to be doing things without telling the civilian review board what's going on. The civilian review board will sort of be in charge of the inspector general's office mm -hmm. um, because we want to make sure that the people have the ultimate say um, on what's going on. Yeah, uh, do you have time to take some questions? My, sure. would, the, would the review board appoint the inspector general subject to the mayor or the council? How, how's that process looking? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not sure that we've made that decision yet. I think, um, at least from my understanding as of right now, I think it will be a joint effort. 
but I think that the mayor would have the final say in who would be the inspector general. Oh, he, he might have veto power. Right. So my, my people, uh, again, Melissa McFadden and Adrian Hood, the two people I would nominate, uh, uh, may, may not make it through. But, uh, you know, we're, we, we hope you get somebody that, uh, I, I know how you are, so you're going to dig in and get us somebody that we can uh, trust and is strong. Yeah, I mean, I think that what my, this was never the thing that is going to fix all of our problems, but I think that if we're consistent and we pay attention and we continue to press, right, this can be a place where we have some really good people at the table, and we've never had access. If we have subpoena power and if we have a good office of the inspector general, even if we cannot impose the disciplinary action that we would like, the amount of information that we will have access to, I think will be far and above what we normally would know. And you can take a case to the federal government. You can skip everybody and go up there. And if we're able to build cases ourselves and have access to this information ourselves, if we get to a point where we feel like negotiating with the mayor or negotiating with the city attorney or negotiating with the FOP is not actually producing any changes, we can go above them. All right. um, and so I hope that this also provides us with the leverage to actually say, no, really, we have a racist police department and we need to do something about this. Right. Uh, let's see. Uh... Does uh, Adrian or Melissa, uh, either of you have a question uh, on this? I'm well, sure anybody. you guys are, and anyone else out there who, uh, you know. I'm on my phone, so you have to read. I can't uh, do the chat and the video. Oh, got the it. So if someone has a question, you can just read it to me and I can try and answer. Actually, I had a question for you, Jasmine. Uh, did you guys uh, try to see if you could get review, uh, the Civilian Review Board would have the power to <laughs> your officer complaints on discrimination? That is a really good point. I don't think I we have discussed that. Um, no, I think I don't think that we discussed things coming from the officer's point of view. Because okay. um, I'm not sure that we would regard them as civilians, but I'm not, I can absolutely bring that up in our next meeting. I think that that's a really good question. Like who, cause obviously there's the system isn't working and they don't feel comfortable, right? Like the things that black officers say to me in private versus what they say in public is drastically different. Um, and I don't know if, if many of them feel comfortable actually coming forward. We got somebody uh, saying the biggest concern is that the review board will become political and then it won't be effective. Um, and so it does sound like you're, you're addressing those concerns. It's Columbus and everything <laughs> is political. And it's like, I am, I am trying our, I think that um, in this moment, there is some desire to do the right thing. And so we need to seize this moment and pay attention and focus and like start off well. Um, it's, it is like, I don't, it's the game, right? Like I have sort of redeemed myself in some ways, but they're still never going to hire me in certain offices and in certain departments to work with certain people on certain things. And it's just, it just is what it is. Uh, but I think that we've gotten much, as we've run these races, right? Like as we've done the rep your block stuff, as we've started to learn, we've learned how to play the game a little bit better. And I think that we're a little bit more savvy than they give us credit for at this point. Can you still run for city council if you're on this work group? Uh, if you're on the work group, yes. If you're on the civilian review board, um, I don't know if you would have to recuse yourself. That's a good question, and I'm gonna write that down right now. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I'm trying to find a piece of paper. <laughs> Adrian, did you have something to say? I think she, she unmuted. So, her. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, um, Jasmine had answered it. Um, but I did have, um, I have another question as far as, um, have y'all decided how many will be on the civilian review board? Um, 
so our number was floating between seven and 11. I think most of us decided on nine as a good number. Um, there needs to be enough people that folks don't get overwhelmed with their work, but there needs to not be too many people that there's just too many cooks in the kitchen. And so I know that we were sort of between seven, nine and 11. Um, and I believe that we're probably going to stick with the nine. Um, but I can review our notes from our last call. Uh, but the final set of recommendations will be in the next um, the next call that we have. Um, and I can make sure that I share that information with you all. Thank you. We appreciate that. Okay. And, and all you, of the uh, materials are on there, right? So they gave presentations about what the other cities are doing across the country, right? How some places do this and how some places do that. And so there's a lot of really good information in there and also just about the process of how the FOP contract is negotiated. So if you're interested in any of those things, it's they set up a, a web page um, and it is literally all in one place and you can nerd out over all of it. What's the web page? Jasmine. Oh, yeah. Jasmine, Jasmine, can you? Okay, so with the um, either way, seven, nine, eleven. Um, you were saying earlier um, that you guys were contemplating um, the elected slash appointed um, piece. If it became um, as such, how many would be elected and how many would be appointed, and who are they getting appointed by? So I am literally like the only person saying that we should have some elected that people should choose some of these people in here so that's probably not going to happen it is my dream and I'm going to keep saying it out loud in hopes to like hold them accountable um but what I was saying was basically like five appointed four elected um one from each side of town and it would sort of mirror the expansion of Columbus City Council and their award seats mm -hmm. um and it would sort of be run how we do um I am blanking on our very local neighborhood size commissions. Thank you. Area commission. area commissions, which don't get super political. Um, and so I'm, I'm everything in Columbus is political. Um, and so if you're saying that the mayor's appointment is less political than someone running in their own neighborhood right. to be elected to the civilian review board, I'm not really understanding that. Um, and they claim that the police are going to spend a whole bunch of money electing people to the board, but I'm like, they would have already done that with council members if that was the case. So, um, what well, I well, virtually so none of them live in the city, <laughs> they're like an occupying army, right? And so, basically, I think our best bet is to say we want community leaders and we want community organizations to have a say in who gets picked. I think that is most likely what we will end up with or what is most realistic. Um, and so I think taking the time to think about who do you want advocating for you and who do you think would have some sense in picking who's gonna be on the civilian review board? Who do you trust? What organizations do you trust? What pastors do you trust? What community leaders do you trust? Um, so I think that's likely where we will end up. I'm going to keep shouting about it, but I don't think that I'm going to get my way. All right, well, it sounds like you're doing a great service now. Uh, again, any other? Jamie? Any other questions for Jasmine while we have her? Do you have the um, time? Are you doing any consideration for new American communities? Um, so I asked about this because I asked, like, legally, can we have certain set aside? Um, I'm not sure legally if we can say 30% needs to be representative of the African American community because that's representative of the population. Uh, but I know that number one in the in the people who pick the focus in the civilian review board right like we need to have the somali community center which is over at northern lights right like we need to have care there like there i think that if we include those organizations then they will be able to pick someone from their community uh, to be able to represent them but we also talked about having advisory seats right so like someone under the age of 18 can't serve but we absolutely need to have youth at the table Right, so we talked about having um, certain 
demographic groups that like we may not be able to specifically say they need to be on the board, but that we need to hear from. Um, and I think all of those suggestions are absolutely welcome. And so I think that we will have a set of advisory roles that come along to sort of support that and make sure that we have a, a, a breadth of perspectives. And as soon as we're done, um, I will pull up the link to the page and I'll drop it in the chat. Great, All right. perfect. So Melissa, do you wanna see if Melissa? Yeah, yeah, Melissa McFadden maybe can talk a little about her book, but I do see the Honorable Judge Terry Jamison out there and uh, maybe there'll be room on the board for judges, particularly those uh, who have done coal mining. I would like to say this publicly. There's maybe one other judge, but the only judge I ever see at things in the community is Judge Jameson. And so I appreciate you because you are at all the things and you are always there. And most people, I just see their billboards every few years. And so we, we appreciate you <laughs> like being present. Yeah, she's one of the only ones that comes to places where there's not checks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Your Honor. We, we thank you, you, want, you want to say hi, uh, Your Honor? Okay. Well, let me say hello and thank you to all the voters of Franklin County for the opportunity to sit on the 10th District Court of Appeals. And the jurisdiction of this court is so important when you think about it's the only uh, appellate district in the state that handles appeals for workers' compensation victim of crime compensation, uh, appeals from the Ohio Court of Claims when you file a lawsuit against the state of Ohio. And it also hears the appeals for public records request when a governmental agency does not um, respond. And Bob, you know how that important those public I, I records- I think that's uh, perhaps the most important law in the state when you're under uh, when you're going after corruption so I, i'm in total agreement with you so you know and um i can i can say this was this was probably the toughest race i've had out of the three i had uh given that i was running against an incumbent that had been seated in three different courts for 28 years without a loss so that let me know that my community wanted me there and I appreciate my community and I am part of the community. So I will always be in the community. So been there since I moved here in 83 and intend to continue working within the community and um, making myself available to the voters. And, so thanks for the opportunity and thank you for and, all and your And ran without permission just ran and went to the people in one originally and still did. Well, you know, uh, what is the old saying? I'd rather ask for forgiveness than permission. <laughs> That's always been my strategy since I was a kid. All right. Thank you, Your Honor, and congratulations. No, thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. I don't know if Jasmine is still with the Nearshot, but we did want to thank her for her uh, service on the Civilian Review Board as well, representing the rest of us. So thank you, Jasmine, if you can still hear us. And um, Ernest, did you have a question? Did you have your hand raised? Might be too late if Jasmine's already jumped off. Maybe not. Okay, Melissa McFadden, would you like to talk a little bit? Yeah, you noticed that particularly you're with about us? your book. <laughs> well, actually I wanted to make a comment about the Civilian Review Board. Um, it's so important, the fact that um, the fact that um, the FOP is negotiating with uh, about the Civilian Review Board is very concerning for me. Um, they always bring up the cap, the fact that they negotiated the BWCs, the body worn cameras. But if you actually look at the policies or contractual language when the body worn cameras, they literally gutted it. We can't do, uh, if I find something that's not authorized random review that I'm supposed to write down and all this stuff, I can't discipline an officer. My, the first thing I find on the camera, I have to give them positive corrective action. It's like three different times I find something randomly that I can't discipline them. So they literally gutted the policy. So it's very hard to discipline an officer out of a body-worn camera incident 
if it's not a part of an investigation or a complaint. So I just hope that does not happen when it comes to the civilian review board because we need the teeth of that to make it work. And so hopefully. <laughs> right, and Melissa McFadden is the highest ranking uh, minority female officer in the department and the author of The Thin Black Line uh, and the only police officer I know who uh, actually led a chant for justice in front of the uh, police department. <laughs> So, <laughs> which I still believe will be one of the great historical moments commemorated someday, I'm hoping with a statue. <laughs> well, thank you. But yeah, so I just hope that the Civilian Review Board doesn't get gutted because that's what their intention will be. That's what they'll try to do to give it, to make it very weak so officers can't get disciplined. So just hopefully that won't happen because the mayor has the upper hand because of the election. So if he has to go to arbitration on that, he has a lot of leverage to win that. All right. And uh, you're, you're available to be the uh, the inspector general, aren't you? Well, I, I could retire to be the inspector general. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, and do, you wanna, you wanna say a few words forward. about your book, you know, how uh, what it's about and how people can uh, uh, find it? Well, the thin black line is a, it's me walk, it's called walking the thin black line and it's on Amazon. It's also at the Ujama bookstore in the cultural market on Fifth Avenue. And what it is, is it's my 24 years of experience dealing with not only the racism towards the black community that I see the officers engage in, as well as the other side of the line is me walking that line as an officer inside experiencing discrimination as well. And so that 24 years chronicles the struggle in both. And it goes all the way up to our recent protests where I talk about how we were unprepared, how we did the citizens, how we did them. And if you watch those videos, they, 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 they gave you guys like four videos to look at on the website, mm -hmm. but internally there's a whole bunch more videos. And I had to stop looking at them because it was so disappointing and disheartening how they mistreated our citizens during that time. And if you listen to officers, they, they call it riots. They, they call it riots. It was actually protests, but they call it riots. That's their way of justifying the behaviors that occurred those days. Well, I, so, I think it might have been a riot, a police riot in some cases, <laughs> <laughs> at least among some of those white officers I saw, uh, just like uh, 1968 in Chicago, right? Kerner report said it was a police riot. Uh, <laughs> I guess you got a point riot. You can't so neglect the history, the history surrounding that time and what led up to that and, and the force coming from the statements from the White House and everything like that. And it was just like Columbus, even though, yeah, and it's a capital city, right? You don't, you know all this, Melissa. So it's the image, the image of, you know, there's law and order in Columbus, Ohio mm -hmm. kind of thing. And but then you also have the subterfuge of people you know, associating with these other right-wing groups, maybe, or yeah, who knows, you know, it's, I'm sorry. <laughs> right, so that's what the book is about. It's $9.99 on Amazon or at the Ujama Bookstore or Culture Market. Um, I priced it that low because I'm trying to expose the division because until they get exposed, they won't change. And so that's my hope is to expose them to a point where they have no choice but to change. And hopefully with Biden being in, our Department of Justice will come back and look at our Columbus Police Department. And maybe this time our leadership won't fight against the Department of Justice like they did in, in 1999. So that's the goal. Um, it's just a terrible environment to be in. And they do police differently. The black communities police differently than any other community in Columbus. Um, there's not a lot of outreach. There's not a lot of um, community policing going on, period, I think. And uh, we need a change from the top down. So thank you for having me. And I think one of the reasons may be what uh, Adrian Hood said, uh, who has a, uh, I think a stunning quote on the, uh, from the mayor. Uh, Adrian, uh, uh, could you repeat that and tell me where you heard that? I mean, that's just outrageous. So I happened to have a conversation um, with a, a young up and coming lawyer who clearly didn't know who I was. 
but um, he was having a conversation uh, with another one of um, the gentlemen here about all of the um, rioting as, you know, as it's been termed. Um, and he was saying how his team, because he um, is now with Baker Hostetler, um, and how they were having to review all of those videos. And, um, and the mayor stated that those videos would not um, be seen by the public because the city would, they would burn the city down. That's how bad the videos were. Well, it, it's real uh, clear, and I know uh, Melissa knows this as well as you do. I mean, my our firm picked up some of the cases. The massive systematic overcharging, you know, by by the end of that campaign by the police and suppression. Uh, I mean, they were charging virtually everyone they could with, you know, felony rioting. Uh, I mean, people. Uh, uh, we had two cases at our firm where people were walking up, saw the police beating people, spraying people, uh, and they turned around and ran, and the police ran after them, knocked them down, and then charged them with rioting. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, I mean, they were singled out, uh, and in both cases, of course, they were black. Yeah, I know one, a young man who um, was assaulted, um, in that same way um and he actually has it on video and he's going back and forth with them after the fact like you know why did you why did you mace me like that um but i watched that whole video and they literally were just um you know walking away um from all of the activities and were i mean they were just doused um with mace but you see the whole encounter um on his video and it was just kind of you know as they are oftentimes um very nonchalant uh, melissa you were going to say something i was going to say it's just so disheartening to me watching those videos and then the fact that they did an investigation and the officers we they, they know who did what like if you're next to me and you mace someone i know that you mace that person it's not like i would forget that you did that because it's something that we don't do necessarily every day so when they went to the investigations and they all decided not to tell on each other, that's what they do. They close ranks and they don't tell on each other. And so there's nothing that can be done. So my fear is these other videos that they didn't show you, they didn't show the public, they didn't put on the website, they're just still not gonna be able to identify who the officers are. They're still not gonna be able to, able to identify them and the officers are not going to come out. But they also gave us an opportunity to show it to all the division to, to, to report anonymously who they think these people are. But I don't think it's gonna work. I think they're not gonna tell. And I think that they're scared if they tell, they'll be labeled a snitch. So, and retaliate against for telling. So I don't see much coming out of this criminal investigation piece, just like the first investigation they did. So just be prepared for that. Well, I just wanna point out how brave you are as a Thank current you. police. <laughs> officer writing that book and coming out publicly and having you know having the courage more courage than anybody to tell the truth and oh, I definitely you. want to keep you safe <laughs> you know, protect you. You from you. all the things thank that might be happening to you i also want to point out that adrian is our um free press award winner this year our libby award winner for her courage and her perseverance and in, in the pursuit of justice as well. I mean, even when they know who the police officers are that have done the, the bad deeds, does anything happen? And it'd be interesting to see if the Civilian Review Board can bring up things like that that happened in the past, even. Will it only be everything going forward or will they be able to say, hey, look at Zach Rosen, you know, look at Jason. Yeah, we, we really need to put pressure on uh, Gary Tayak uh, with his conviction integrity uh, uh, program and, and make them, you know, we need to be able to isolate uh, the, uh, uh, the police that are doing the disproportionate amount of damage and get them out of the judicial system uh, mm -hmm. as they have in uh, other areas. Well, Bob? thanks for everybody that was speaking on this. Somebody had a comment? Yeah, I, I just want to say, uh, in my opinion, uh, Gary Tyak. Uh, is the biggest reform uh, factor in our community on police uh, conduct. And uh, 
Gary Tyak is, a, is an ethical uh, lawyer. Uh, Ron O'Brien is not. Ron <laughs> O'Brien is responsible for uh, being shot in the back, um, being charged with assault. Uh, he he is a he is a he should he should have been uh, he should have been uh, brought up on ethics charges and, he, and he's a disaster. We got a couple of announcements now. Uh, Sandy Balzinius, um, do you have your mic on so you can give us your uh, pitch or about a movie coming up? Yes. <laughs> it took me a little bit to let me start my video. Um, sorry about that. Okay, so actually I have two things to mention. Um, one event is coming, um, I'm going to post both of them. One event is with um, Joe Motil, um, and that's going to be the 19th of, um, that's Thursday, the 19th of November. And it's a not to miss event because um, it's going to be virtual on Zoom through Move to Men Central Ohio. And um, so I'm trying to post this as I'm talking. And it's going to be, um, um, he's going to be talking about tax abatements in Columbus. I mean, how does that work here? And um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing it too. So thanks, Joe, if he's on this call. I'm not even sure if he is. Um, so that's on Thursday, and you can get there, and I think I posted it, but I will check after I'm finished talking. Um, the other thing is, um, and that's, that's 7 to 8, on uh, Move to Men Central Ohio, and I'm going to give you a link from Move to Men where you can find the information. It's a Zoom link. It's easy, free, come, and come for it. Um, the next one is on Friday, and it's a movie. Um, it's an hour movie called um, Hard Road of Hope, and um, there's a pretty young director and producer of it, um, Eleanor um, Green um, Goldfield. And um, she's involved. Since I heard her name, I'm hearing her everywhere. So she's on, she's pretty, pretty good. In the movie, I've seen it. It's excellent. It um, talks about West Virginia coal fields, coal mines, and, and you know, gets into the opiates and public policies and corporations and environment. It's, it's really amazing. And she will be after, she will be, um, um, on the, she'll be talking after the show. So it, that's on Friday, um, the 20th of November, um, and it's a Zoom, and I'm going to send you the link for that too. It does, we're asking $12 for it. Um, if, if her point was, it's really important that people see it. So if you can't afford it or it's not in your budget right now, you know, you can still sign up for it. Um, and then let, let people know about it. It's, it's a really important film and it's about West Virginia, but really it's about what's going on everywhere in this country. <laughs> Thank you, Sandy. So, thanks. Yeah, make sure you post those and then I'll send them out in the email I send out after the salon. And then Pat Morita wanted to let us know that uh, what's going on with HB6 real quick. Oh yeah. Pat Morita, are you unmuted? Okay, I finally, I finally got unmuted. Um, uh, so, well, House Bill uh, Six repeal is uh, is bill is being heard in the Senate Public Senate Energy and Public Utilities Committee next Tuesday. It's opponent hearing, so uh, people that do not want it appealed, repealed, will will uh, be testifying. Uh, there are also uh, a number of other bills. I put them in the chat so you can kind of see it. But this same committee on Tuesday is going to be hearing uh, a bill that would eliminate automatic enrollment in gas and electric aggregation. That's the big thing that just passed in Columbus. And this is trying to uh, stop people from automatically. So you'd have to opt in and, you, and um, that would be a big setback. So that's what they're trying to set back the, uh, the uh, aggregation. Uh, the, 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 there is one good bill that they're hearing on Tuesday. It's a, a expansion of residential broadband. And then the most horrible thing of all is this House Bill 104. And they're also hearing proponent testimony for that. It already passed the committee in the House. It would establish Ohio as ownership of high level radioactive waste, 
it would subsidize two different kinds of small modular uh, research reactors in, in Ohio. And so that is proponent testimony. And of course, uh, it's really getting kind of dangerous for people to go in person, but you can submit written testimony, but you cannot uh, testify like by Zoom. And then on top of all that, uh, I don't know when they're going to be heard, but there's the House Bill 786 that would suspend certification of major solar and wind farms. And there's another new bill that would criminalize protest. So there you have it, Ohio State House. Hmm. And then not to mention somebody just, uh, Michael Kakonis just mentioned about a bill that was just passed that would uh, try to stop more protesting. Oh, Ernest, you finally got on here. Did you wanna make your, your uh, comment? Oh no, I'm 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 good, Mike. My question was for Jasmine, but I'll go ahead and and uh, raise a concern with her. But I did real quick want to speak, ask about that um, that protest bill. Yeah. Um, that's something that's you know really detrimental to a lot of my comrades that are out here, you know, trying to voice the trying to give a voice to the people who don't have one. Um, my question is. And I, and I read bits and pieces of the, what all does that bill actually entail besides actually now, I think it's a fifth degree or yeah, a fifth degree felony now, which implies, which, which now uh, gives jail time. Am I correct about that or not? Michael Kokonis, you had uh, the comment. Do you have any comment? Can you uh, answer that question? Do you have a mic? Oh, she does not have a mic. Um, I haven't researched this, but what she wrote was, uh, let's see, He's jumping around. Let's see. Criminalizing actions as riots when even something as small as a fist fight might break out. It's mm -hmm. a lame duck bill. So many, uh, there's, okay, what a testimony, uh, written testimony. Um, I'm afraid I don't know enough about it to yeah, give all the details. A lot of these bills are Alex, and uh, probably most of you also saw. Uh, the use of deadly force if there's a riot uh, was also uh, introduced, uh, you know, the equivalent of a stand your ground, but one that gives you an affirmative right to shoot people if they're and rioting. Ohio? Yeah, yeah. And all this stuff is coming from the American Legislative uh, Exchange Council, right? This is all model legislation. So Ernest, I think this is something we really need to uh, be aware of and I don't know Michael if you could write in the chat if you know if it's going to be coming up like really soon like it's something that we need to be addressing between now and probably the next salon which would be the second Saturday in December do you have any more information I know you can't talk but maybe you could type something in or if you can talk anyway we'll wait to see if she types anything in but I had just heard about that for the first time today and then she's mentioning it so I'm not sure a lot of people know about this she, said, bill. she said you can search the link above so somebody posted a link in the chat um, three gun bills too they say you felt threatened after you shoot also eliminating the requirement for training for buying guns also not coming up no to committee so what I got to say is who in their right mind would want to do business in a fascist state? So uh, you want to boycott Ohio? Yeah, well, we, we can make it. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so uh, really good point there. I think the free press should look into that bill, all, all these bills, and get something written about right. it. Right. I mean, this is all because of the gerrymandered uh, control of the Republican Party and uh, in the state. I mean, uh, also the fact that we're a divided state, but you got 12 Republican U.S. reps and only four uh, Democrats. So as long as they continue to do this gerrymandering, they're going to give us these incredibly right-wing fascistic uh, bills, uh, which, which includes, of course, the, you know, standing your ground if you think somebody's rioting. And remember, uh, you know, all we hear is how the left riots and uh, uh, these illegal militias, right? They are absolutely illegal. Uh, uh, nothing happens to them when a thousand of them show up at the Capitol uh, with their weapons. Uh, and again, a brief plug. Uh, I know Marilyn was here. Marilyn wrote the introduction to my 
a book that's coming out July, Ohio State University Press that I co-wrote on the history of white supremacy in Ohio, which exposes the, you know, uh, the decades long and centuries long practice of white supremacy and how these uh, uh, new groups, these militia groups, these uh, 3% groups are all in essence white supremacists. Uh, just on the in the subject of people giving announcements, Brian, did you want to talk about your your event? Brian Curtis looks unmuted. So, yeah. Yes, go ahead. All right. Um, so WCRS is having their first vo virtual volunteer meeting in like first volunteer meeting in ages. <laughs> Uh, I don't know how many volunteer meetings WGRN has had, but probably more than zero. <laughs> I don't think, no, I don't think so. What? No, we, you guys are much more volunteer heavy than WGRN, WCRS is. You mean it's all, you mean it's all you? <laughs> no, no, it's all Tim Chavez. Uh, is... <laughs> it's all Tim Chavez at this point, but go ahead and tell, talk about uh, your- Yeah, so I put the information in the chat which I copied, edited, and pasted from the email that Rob sent all the WCRS volunteers. And um, do you want to just tell us a little bit about what- So the, the volunteer meeting is Thursday. We're basically going to be catching up. And since we haven't done anything, we haven't had a virtual meeting ever. Well, what time? Thursday starts at 6.30. Okay. But meeting start till seven, but Rob's gonna try to get it set up early so people can like get if they get lost and whatnot. So what kind of volunteers is WCRS looking for? Like people to do shows or people to help Rob well, people part? That's a that's a good question. Um and if you want to know, come to the meeting. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a Rob question. <laughs> and unfortunately, I'm not Rob. Okay, Mark Stansberry and Chuck Lind, you guys want to just give your brief uh, announcements? We've, got, we've gone way over time here, but I kind of figured- Oh yeah. yeah, I'm going to go back to watching us lose, so. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, they're down 14 nothing. I know. Um, next next month, Salon is up to the Ohio game unless the Buckeyes all get COVID after Thanksgiving. <laughs> so, so Mark, are you able to talk, or do you want us just to read what you put there in the in the chat? Prevailing wages under attack. There's some legislation in the Ohio in the Ohio legislature. Yeah, I was I was quickly re re. Uh, researching 784 mm -hmm. is the one they were talking about the anti-riot uh thing and then there's also a, the same woman these two women uh republican gop people uh from hamilton southwest ohio are really spearheading sort of like how the woman the senator that was down in southwest ohio that did the sb5 stuff back in the day mm -hmm. but they're really putting forward some of this really bad stuff really bad stuff so just keep a track of what's going on. I'm glad Pat's down there trying to keep track of how General Assembly, this lame duck stuff is gonna be dangerous this year. It's really gonna be dangerous. So pay attention and don't let it disappear. Prevailing wage, I don't know if anybody knows that concept, but that that is a uh, an, an effort to keep people paid equally, even if you're not in a union, to be paid with what is a prevailing wage of construction mainly construction, but other places as well. So that's it, it, that, that was just introduced. It hasn't moved very far, but just know that this lame duck is gonna be very active. And then and I uh, also would like, I would also like us to start thinking about doing some kind of people's forum on economic, the political economy um, at, at, during the pandemic, uh, because you know, evictions are, uh, the, the, the uh, stay on evictions is ending December 26th, happy, or Merry Christmas to everybody oh um, and that whole deal. So, okay, Chuck's turn. <laughs> and Chuck, you mentioned that there uh, will be a replay of the public banking town hall meeting somewhere. Oh, you got a link yeah, for it? I put the link in the uh, chat and I also put a link into our little calendar, which is very cool, upcoming events this week in, in, Jan in December. But I wanted to say that uh, Kathy Callum Becker is now working 
to help Simply Living with our uh, Gift and Be Simple auction coming up uh, right. end of November into December. So look for announcements and uh, it's going to be very cool with a lot of, a lot of great stuff, a way to support uh, Simply Living. And it starts on Black Friday, so you can do guilt-free shopping uh, for cool things from Simply Living members. Do you want to say anything about that, Kathy? No. Um, sure. Sorry, it took me a minute to get off of mute. But yeah, this is a little bit different um, from the usual gift to be simple, which is usually a gathering. But with COVID, um, we decided to do an online auction of some new things, some gently used things, some um, businesses may be offering some services and just a lot of really interesting items are going to be there. And this is going to open November 27th, like Chuck said on Black Friday and run through Saturday to December 5th. And it's at give.simplyliving.org. Yeah, put that in the, there it is. So that's in the chat, yeah, I'll be sending Just that. getting started, but uh, if you have items to donate, let us know and you can actually do that online. I would add that we're showing the movie Kiss the Ground, which is about how to reverse global warming. This is an exciting movie. We're going to show it on December 2nd. It's available now on Netflix. So check it out. We'll have a discussion with uh, some people who are doing uh, permaculture, uh, regenerative agriculture right here in Central Ohio. Uh, so it's going to be a fun discussion about that film. It's a very optimistic film in the sense that uh, not many environmental films <laughs> have a good message for actually how we can get out of this mess, but uh, carbon sequestration seems to be one of them that uh, we could do if we had enough political will. Sounds very good. All right, so I think we're gonna wrap up here now. I appreciate everybody's participation. I don't think that Marilyn's still with us. I wanted to thank Marilyn for jumping in and giving us her insight. It was great to see Judge Jameson here and uh, Adrian and everybody else, Melissa. And I'm especially happy to see Diane Roller. We haven't seen that Diane Roller for many, many months. So great to see, see you out here. And there's Will Perkins and, oh, Laurel, I'm sorry. We had one more announcement. <coughs> Laurel? Uh, thanks, Suzanne. Hi, um, I wanted to let you know that I am selling a, uh, an item to promote the Green New Deal. This is it. I called the bandana. Nice. It's, it's a bandana that is a banner. It's a quick uh, protest or rally item. Um, you can get it at bandanner.com and all of the profits are going to progressive and environmental groups. This is the website right here. So it's Thanks, band, bandana. Yeah, bandanner.com. Right. Great. And then I see one final thing is the Museum of Art will have a virtual exhibition talk on Wednesday at six. Doesn't say what the, what the subject matter is. Oh, Amina Robinson's house and journals. That's very interesting. And did somebody else have something to say? Yes, yeah, Susan, I was, um, I was trying to get the information from state rep uh, Crawley about, the, um, about this legislation. Um, it's a lot of information that she sent me, so I can just send it to you after this, and then you can share it with everybody. That sounds um, good. Thank you. But she, yeah, she just, uh, I'm sorry, it was taking her to uh, get back uh, to me, but um, she said, among other things, it allows people like Kyle Wittenhouse um, from Illinois to Kenosha during the George Floyd protests were to kill people who are protesting to kill someone and get away with it. So you're right or whatever this um, season, especially since um, our state house is um, Republican led super majority. I think it's 60 to 30 or something like that. Um, so we definitely are going to be having to pay attention, but I will send you the information that she just sent me so okay. we can share it with everybody. I'll include that well, in my you. email and yeah, send later. Thank you Thanks. very much. And then Terry's saying, do we know anything about the Georgia runoff? Uh, the, 
other than it's going to be a uh, full uh, runoff with eyeballs on it. And uh, uh, I, I suspect that, uh, you know, Biden uh, will win. I mean, the uh, notorious Republican Secretary of State is now under fire from the Trump people, which I see as uh, a, a good sign. So, uh, so now he's under fire from the progressive Democrats, Stacey Abrams, uh, and Trump. Uh, so I think it's going to be a fair count. There'll be people there from both parties. And it's supposed to be a full hand recount, which, you know, will be transparent. And I believe that uh, Biden uh, well, will win. Wait, what about the two senators? Oh, the uh, a lot of what is happening. Uh, I mean, Lindsey Graham, Mitch McConnell are going along uh, uh, with this whole process uh, in hopes of having power. But uh, is the question, my understanding is that uh, they were only going to count the presidential race. So uh, as opposed to the uh, uh, senators, I don't, th I don't think- The senators happened in, in, the, in January. Right, right, yeah. But the senators don't want their races uh, recounted, right? While you were looking at Trump, you could recount the Senate races because uh, there's been questions about whether there's funny numbers in terms of the uh, reps and, and the senators. So uh, again, it'll be a, a Trump recount uh, and they should have uh, plenty of time to do it without delay and it will be a full hand recount. But what about, I mean, the specific question is about the two senators that are gonna be recounted in January. No, they're not going to be recounted. That's when the runoff is. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah, the, the runoff. How do you think that's going to turn out? Well, it's turning out right now is that people refuse to condemn Trump and are supporting his nonsense uh, about, uh, you know, the stealing of the elections. Uh, and they will because they're worried. The Senate is at stake, right? If it right. go uh, again Democratic. Uh, then it's 50-50, and uh, of course, uh, Kamala Harris will be the deciding vote. So is that what you think will happen? I don't know. It depends on how much money comes in the state. I mean, this their state will be massively flooded with money, so it really depends on the people. Well, whether we make sacrifices, we help out, we recruit people, uh, if you're concerned over who controls the Senate in this country, which I know most of the people are. Uh, somebody's saying that there was a B-1 bomber that flew over Columbus yesterday. Yeah, that was on the news. And do we know why? Did it say why a B-1 bomber <laughs> flew over Columbus? This is not making me feel happy. It was well, well, Air Force planes from time to time will fly over here because Wright-Patterson's only 70 miles away. That's true. Wright-Patterson's a sack base, so just about anything in the Air Force arsenal can land there and flies out of there and does training missions out of there. And somebody else noted that uh, even if mo both De Democrats win the runoff in Georgia, the West Virginia Senator said he would not go along with it. What, who, what, what kind of power does that person have? Uh, the power to vote any way he wants, including with Republicans. Uh, as as opposed to the Democrats. So what does he have to oh, do? Oh, Joe Manchin, aka Giuseppe Mancini. Right, uh, exactly. Uh, no, it, it, what he's saying is that uh, you know, just like Bernie Sanders caucuses with the Dems, there's nothing that could stop him from you know voting with the Republicans. Mm -hmm. And uh, then somebody else is pointing out. Michael's pointing out that uh, we can volunteer with election defenders to help people in Georgia. Um, so maybe we can send out some information about that if people want to get involved in that runoff election. Okay. All right. So this is uh, some deadline dates about that Steve put up about that runoff, but I think we're going to wrap it up. I just wanted to say hi to everybody that's here. Hi, Charlie. Hello. We said hi to Laurel and Adrian, Brian, John Lasker. Thank you very much for uh, your help with all of this and everything that and you do. Jasmine. Yeah, getting Jasmine to come speak. Margaret Everybody and Stuart. Stay Wright. safe, okay? Okay. Margaret Seriously, and Stuart. Everybody stay safe. Wear your okay. mask. Don't go out. Things are bad. 
from a PSA by Charles Austin. Thank you very much. And Margaret and Stuart, well, it's always nice to see you. I can see Margaret, can't see Stuart, but we'll take, we think he's probably around somewhere. Lindsay Park, I'm not sure uh, if we know who you are, but thanks for coming. It's always good to see you, Will Perkins. I see you were being active in the chat. And uh, Tara Jamison, her term begins on July 1st, 2020. Congratulations again. Tekla, hi Tekla. Great to see you. Uh, Mr. Andre. And there's Marilyn, she's still here. Marilyn, uh, I think we wanted to thank you very much for your participation. I hope you come back and yeah, join us again. Uh, yeah, it was really fun. So yeah, I will be back. <laughs> and uh, Mary Jane, thank you for all your work. Hopefully we'll be hearing some more marijuana. You Tim Chavez, our, our uh, WGRN volunteer, who also wanted to point out that Jamie Pardo is just as much of a volunteer as him. So we'll give him a plug too. Joe Motil. <laughs> Hi, Charlotte. You're also an elected official, I believe. You and Adrian. Uh, yes, just not to the legislature. I'm on right, the right, right. We, we can't blame you for the that stuff. Service Center board. He's a central committee member. And I am on the Fairfield County Educational Service Center board, and it's elected. It's nonpartisan, but it's elected. Ah, uh, nice. And uh, Rick, not sure who you are, but welcome. And hi, Cliff, and hi, Clark Matthews, Steve Caruso. Wilhelm. Oh, is it Rick Wilhelm? Sorry, your picture is little teeny tiny face up there. <laughs> well, Rick Wilhelm, how great to see you. Long time no see. Thanks. Well, um, Melissa, great to talk to you again. And we got your book, and we're promoting it. Mark Stansberry. Uh, Brad Davies, not sure who you are, but welcome. Sandy Bolzinius and Connie Hammond. Thank you so much for keeping up your email with all the Peace Action news in it. We have Jill Lewis. Oh, Stuart Wright is separate. <laughs> He's got his own computer, I guess. There's Pat Morita. Somebody named Timmy Pappas is not familiar. Brenda Hosey. Mark Stansberry, of course. Paul Becker, our photographer, who's supposed to be taken and away. And a cute dog. Under the name yeah, uh, of Brenda. Brenda. Paul Becker claimed he was going to take a break from photography. And next thing you know, he's posting more pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't stay away. But he did take a half hour break. Yeah. And Kathy Cowan Becker, always a very uh, active person. And welcome, Mark Martha Dillard. So we do want to thank very much so Steve Caruso. I think people can, had seen him. Thanks, pop Steve. Up. Steve is our technical guru and uh, making sure that no Zoom bombers get in as they did on one of our- Or B1 bombers too. He <laughs> drove <laughs> on B1 <laughs> bombers. That would really suck. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, everybody have a good night. Bob and I haven't had our dinner yet, so we're kind of hungry. Could I okay. <laughs> yeah, go, ahead. go ahead, Cliff. Cliff's got one last word. Yeah, I wanted to correct myself. Uh, the, the, the partisan split on the U.S. Supreme Court is 6-3. I forgot six, three. Clarence, yeah. Clarence you Thomas. Hear that. That's not good. Because uh, <laughs> Robert, Roberts, which is good on certain things, uh, is on the election stuff, is always going with the conservatives. Boo. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for keeping us up to date on stuff, Cliff. Thanks for scaring the hell out of us, Cliff. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so Steve Crusoe, you can go ahead and close us down, and everybody have a nice day, nice rest of the day, weekend, week. Y'all so take care. Suzanne, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Yeah, Bye -bye. I'm not sure yet have what time on Maryland, but y I'll send you an email, or we can let Juanita decide. Okay. All right, and, and uh, are you telling everyone to get that book when it comes out on white supremacy? You betcha. Oh, well, not <laughs> only that. Betcha. You can hear Marilyn Howard and uh, Joan Jones every week on the Pink Pill on 9.30 a.m. on WGRN.org. Very scintillating and fascinating intellectual dialogue between them about the issues of the day. And the special appearances are then on the other side of the news. <laughs> yeah, that's right. We haven't done that for a while. Get that going. Get yeah. that going. But it's always great to see Bob. I don't get to see him very much anymore. So it's always good to see my big brother. 
Well, we'll All right. we're, you're on the list. We'll be getting in touch with you for his show soon. Okay. See you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Stay warm. Winter's coming. Really? Yep. Turn on your heater.